This episode of the Blind Man Dan podcast is proudly brought to you by Country Duds. A bad word doing good things. I swear it's country. All right, boys, girls, it's all choose. Blind Man Dan's poor sight. Poor bastards running into objects in the broad daylight. Fuck. Blind Man Dan's now live. This is a hazard. So nut sacks and front cracks, listen up, enjoy the ride. All right, ball bags and front bums, I am coming to you live from Winter Nationals in Brisbane. It's two-thirds of fucking cold. We got ourselves some better beer zeros because there is another way. You don't have to get wasted. And I am uh, here with Ty. Ty, how are you, bud? Good, good. Be yourself. How are you, mate? Just living my best life, mate. Just trying to do a podcast over this um, racket. How are you enjoying it, though? It's different, man. It's a pretty good atmosphere, eh? I never... I haven't been in the drag race and seen shit since I was probably 15 years old. Just never been my thing, but coming here to do this, fuck, it's fun. I suppose, like, I suppose, like, winning that jamboree and stuff like that are probably the best kind of meets to be around. You know, you got all your loud cars. So, guys, it's going to be a bit on and off without talking because we've got to stop every time these big bangers fucking fire it up. So, guys, while I'm here, huge shout-out to the sponsors. i tell you what, Unique Science and Raps in Townsville, you've made this boat turn some fucking heads here at Winter Nationals. Uh, with Sunday Power Sports Marine, guys, thank you for supplying this weapon of a rig. It is um, it's definitely making some people buddy, come over and say good day. It's working out really well. And uh, here's a shout-out to Mullet Mutt for um, stocking me up with some trucker caps to get this really rolling for me. So, um, guys, i got Ty here. So, Ty, how old are you, mate? I am 24 years old, mate. So, Ty's uh, family's fairly heavy in the uh, drag racing scene. Uh, they're called Controlled Insanity Racing. Definitely, that's it. Fuck yeah, doggy. And... Uh, Oh, jeez. I don't think that sound should be legal. I reckon it should be. That's the sound of my people. So, Bungie, there's a fuck ton of sound going on around here. So, what sort of cars out there now? Uh, so, this would be supercharged outlaws. So, what our family mainly races in. Uh, this is probably our main kind of race cars. So, what sort of horsepower are these things running? Oh, they can be anywhere from two and a half to three and a half thousand horsepower, maybe four. Jesus. You know, um, so definitely a lot of horsepower. So you guys did pretty well today. You you pulled a track record or something, what'd you do? So that's a mate's team. Yeah, um, yeah he pulled a national record, backed it up from one run down in Sydney and backed it up down here. So Deep. definitely definitely a good thing. Yeah. Um, you know, so we'll see if we can hold on to it or if not beat it throughout the weekend. Um, it's a bit sad that Dad can't be out here racing because I know that he loves it, but... Yeah. He loves watching his little kids race, and yeah. you know, I've got a little sister, yeah. she's into it yeah, too. Yeah, so. going also. Um, what sort of dollars does it take, like the sort of runs they're doing here? What sort of dollars are involved? Uh, on a good run, you're nice and healthy, motor's still healthy. You're looking at probably two and a half thousand dollars, maybe three. A run. A run. <laughs> you know, you've got to change plugs, oil, uh, fuel. Fuel's the big one. Good yeah. kick in the guts, that is. Um... And food for the crew. Engine. Jesus Christ, they got some note about them, haven't they? I, I love it. To never get old. So you were saying you're um earlier that you're from you did time in the army. So what were you doing in the army? It's a rifleman, so um, you know, got to carry big packs around and shoot big guns. So not so much mucking around vengeance and stuff. No. So when you're you're doing a lot of pit crew on here, are you working on them? Or what are you doing? I've grown up with cars, and you know that comes back to dad. Um, Jesus, much as I can remember growing up as a young fellow, was you know there was always a spanner in my hand, or yeah. even just tinkering around. So so you know your way around drag origin. I, I like to say I do. Yeah, you yeah. know sometimes everyone has a bit of a life up, but yeah, yeah. I, I've been around it for long enough. I'm quite comfortable. Hello. Yeah, Definitely, so I do know my stuff around them. So, what do you feel about the um, the drag racing community? Like, I've noticed this me being here, like everyone's pretty welcoming, eh, and friendly. Yeah, well, you know, Tim, the guy that I'm with this weekend, um, I didn't know him from a bar of soap. He used to just run in Dad's class when he was licensed in the car, and used to watch him. And you know, I admire his car; it's a gorgeous car. Yeah. And you know, used to pop in and you know tell him that he's doing a good pass and. Uh, Probably about four meets ago, we um, we went down to Sydney and he offered to jump in the truck down with him um, oh, yeah. to just save on money on flights and whatnot. Oh, yeah. Got in the truck. Yo! Fuck it out. 
What a show. Love it. So, guys, we'll let you uh, we'll let you listen to this one take off, and then we're going to shut it down, and we're going to move over to the uh, campfire. So Ty's story is pretty heavy, pretty deep, and I do want a lot of you listeners to um, really be able to focus in on this, and I really want to get, you know, as much out of uh, Ty as possible. And so we're going to not do this in the boat next to the drag strip because it's just fucking too loud. But uh, stay tuned, guys. We're going to, um, yeah, we're going to go set up in the quietness beside the fire in the cold because fuck me it's cold and it's the most cock down here so stay tuned all right legends all right party people so we're back we're back in action now we're over in the quieter area it's not fucking dead quiet ty but we're a little bit better oh, definitely a little bit better still uh Rusty bolts moving around. Yeah, there is um, there is a couple of engines firing up around us here, so no doubt that will happen again. But um, this is definitely a better spot for us to get a bit more deeper. So you got fucking floaties on, mate. It's going to get deep. Oh, I've definitely got floaties. So I'll try and set the mood for you guys. We'll sit beside the fire. The uh, the sun is down. It's fucking dark. I can't see my hand in front of my face, but I'm pretty sure everyone else can see what I'm doing. So that's a good start. Can you see me, Ty? Yeah, I can definitely see you. Fucking hero. Anyway, so Ty, you um, what's your what's a bit of a backstory, man? Like you know, you how old are you now? You're 24. Yeah, 24. And um, had a good upbringing, like mum, dad. What's what's the guy? Yeah, so I I can't complain about my upbringing. Um, mum and dad split when I was two, so they separated and lived with dad for a while. Um, and I think that's where the passion of cars really came in. Like that was our bonding kind of stuff. And you know, being a single dad, looking after two kids, he, I, I can't be more proud than that. Um, gave us pretty much everything that we could ask for, working two jobs, you know, going above and beyond. Yeah, nice. And, and mum? Mum, I didn't really have too much to do with her until dad kind of come into a bit of hardship and, you know, it was kind of looking better for us to go over and um, live with mum for a bit. And, you know, I couldn't remember the woman if I'd tripped over her in public. So it was a bit different. Um, didn't really know her too well. Uh, moved in, stayed there for a while. Um, stepdad was probably a bit rougher than anything. Uh, you know, brought up old school. Used to get a bit physical. Um, so yeah, um, but ended up moving back to dad's because I was a bit too much of a pain for my mum and stepdad. So I guess it kind of worked, I guess, and um, spent uh, most of it with Dad and then moved up to Townsville, finished school up there, loved it up there, um, was working at Macca's, going to school, you know, normal teenage stuff. Thought I recognised you. Oh, you oh, fucked my cheeseburger up, you can't. Probably. Too many pickles. <laughs> um, yeah, so finished school up there, did a few odd jobs, solar panel work, um, bit of mechanics, stuff like that. just odd jobs, really. And then... My older brother, he's in the army. Shout out, Nathan. Um, love you. But, um, yeah, he kind of inspired me to join the military. So I went after it and unlocked a few jobs, but I chose to be a grunt out of all of them, um, which is infantry. So, yeah, I, I loved it. Um, I wish I could have stayed in the job for, like, that would have been my lifetime job. So what happened there? Uh, so went to Kapuka and you go through, like, good physical training and stuff like that just to be the best you can um they mold you to what you need to be and there's a i can't really remember it's not a disease or anything like that but underneath your skin on my calf muscles i had a sports induced compartment syndrome so the fascia fascia underneath your skin was constricting the blood flow to my calf muscle so um i had I think it was 10 to 15% of my calf muscle actually cut out because it was just torn off the bone or just had no blood in it, so it was decaying and whatnot. So that was my first setback. Um, I bounced back from that surgery as best as I could, I guess. Um, not many people do. It's a risky surgery, and I tried to take the bullet for it, and it all worked. So I can't be thankful enough for that. And then... So once you go to Kapuka, do all your training, you know, uh, you once you complete Kapuka, you get marched out in sense, and then you go to your Pacific job role training and 
mine was obviously infantry, so you go down to Singleton, do all your training down there, had my surgery down there, um, had a bit of setback. I was there for six months uh, in rehab, getting as best as I could, um, bounced back from that surgery, got into a platoon, uh, made it all the way to the last three weeks, and we were doing a field op, and I got a bit too carried away. I had body armor, rifle on, stuff like that. We're doing a drill, and my boot got stuck in a cam net, and I fell down a two meter pit. And foot went one way, the body went the other, and I snapped my ankle and tore all three ligaments. So that was an interesting and painful one. Um, tried to stand up and whatnot, just sort, you know, just tried to shake it off and. Uh, didn't hurt and with, with all that weight I was probably you know 105 kilos so falling down 10 meters is not really ideal on the best of times so oh, shit um definitely heard a crack and popple and all the rest of it and I had boys all around me they're trying to check up on me and I was like yeah no no I'm good I'm good um tried to stand up and as soon as I put body weight on it, it just collapsed um the medic ended up cutting my boot off and my sock, and when she cut my boot and sock off, my foot had done a full 180. Oh, fuck. So she was fucked. Um, she was purple by the time that it was cut off. Um, so that, that was me done. So got sent back to base, sent to hospital. They patched me up, had a bit of time off, and they didn't realise that it was actually that bad, so they just put a strap on it and, you know, um, had a rest for three weeks and then went back outfield. Completed my course, got signed off, and then sent up back up to Townsville. So got posted up there. You were able to walk on it again that soon? Yeah, um, but there was a lot more damage into it with the brace. Um, so the brace was holding it 95% of the time, and when I was taking it off, it was you know falling back around. And I was struggling to walk. I was tripping over shit, dragging my foot. Um, so. Went and seen a few more doctors, got sent over to a specialist, lower limb specialist, and he said, mate, you've got, you know, 25 hairline fractures, micro fractures all the way through your foot. Um, a bit of bone inside my ankle had chipped off and it had gone in between, uh, like, where your foot kind of pivots. So it was getting mashed on the top of my heel and my tibia. So... I don't know if it's your tibia, actually. Uh, one of the bones. So every time I was walking, it was just crushing and, you know, doing more damage than anything. Um, so I got sent off for surgery. Um, I ended up having a metal plate put in there and six uh, screws just to try and hold all my foot bone back together. And then I had another four put in for artificial ligaments because I had snapped them and they were sitting up around my knee. That's how bad I had torn them. Yeah, so I, I, I'd done a really good fucking job. Um, proper, a proper fuck up. Yeah, it was proper doozy. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, come back from that surgery, that was another, jeez, I think it was a good eight months. I was in rehab, doing a lot of exercise, trying to rebuild their strength. And so with that rehab and everything, did they do that on, on base? Like yeah, you still, all, yeah, all on base. You know, they really look after you. I can't be more thankful for that. You know, they gave me the best option to try and get better. And it looked like I was getting better. You know, I could start, you know, picking up weight and I could start doing a lot of things. And then I started, you know, doing more cardio stuff and running and stuff. And just my calves were sore, my ankle was worse. And just... The only way they could really do anything is possibly uh, medical discharge me. And that was a bit of a kick in the guts because, you know, who, who doesn't want to, you know, get filthy, have fucking some of the best mates and uh, just shoot big guns. Uh, so it was a big kick in the guts and, you know, I wish I could have made a career out of it, but... Everything happens for a reason, I guess. Yeah, I've always said that too. I don't know why some things fucking happen, but hey. No. <laughs> some things would be better if they didn't fucking happen, but yeah. Uh. If I could go back, I, w I would try and be more careful, but in that kind of job, can't be too careful. You know, it, it's just one of them things. You know, a lot of boys get injured, but a lot more bounce back than others. So, so, you, so you got medically discharged. Yep. And then what's that? You just 
you got to study a lot. Yeah, so, like, they help you transition out of the army, you know, see where you're going to move back home, and, um, like, they give you a good hand, you know, try and help you find other jobs. and stuff. Yeah, no, they don't just, here's the gate, get out. Um, so they try and transition you into a new job, um, stuff like that, see what you're interested in, um, all that kind of good stuff. And I, I was pretty lucky. I had a pretty good uh, team support behind me. Um, so moved back down to Gatton, started trying to make a new life, I guess, um, which at first was pretty difficult because, you know, you get used to such a good routine and, you know, your days and kind of constructed around. You knew exactly what you were doing yeah. the next day, yeah. No, um, so I got out and tried finding a job and it took me a oh, good two months, three months. I wasn't in the biggest rush because, you know, I was still trying to get over losing a good job in my eyes and ended up finding a job, worked there for a bit and then started going to the gym trying to really look after myself and try and find kind of like trying to find a purpose in life again you know because it, it's hard to come out of such a good routine and a purpose at a good job and whatnot and then kind of go back to nothing so, you'd feel a bit lost wouldn't you oh you're definitely lost and you know it it's a bit of an awakening i guess like it really wakes you up um but I had good support, you know, Dad was looking after me, you know. Moved back home with Dad, stayed with him for a bit, um, found a job, started going to the gym and just really trying to better myself. What sort of job did you find? I started a mechanic apprenticeship, so I was working for a bit, doing mechanics and, I don't know, when you've been around cars for so long, you kind of get sick of working on someone else's car and then going home, spending your weekends up in the shed, so kind of called it quits there and had a bit of limbo where I just did odd jobs for people and stuff like that and um, ended up finding a really good job with uh, one of my best mates, um, roofing and stuff like that, so loved that job. Yeah, um, you, get a, you get a good team doing that sort of shit, eh? you get good camaraderie and banter throughout the day. Oh yeah, like these boys are ruthless but not to the point where it's bullying, it's you know, just a bit of smack talk and you know, just cheering up your day, you're up, you know, three foot in the air, three stories, sorry. Cooking. Cooking, yeah. Um, you know, working on your tan out there. That is something I definitely like struggle with. Like, you know, you're saying you felt a bit lost. Yeah. You know, um, when I when I ended up selling up all the businesses and whatnot, and just you know, all right, I was gonna be blind man Dan now. Yeah. It's fucking really hard to find. Like, you just say lost. Like, fuck, what do I do today? You wake up. Where do I start? What do I do? You know, like it's it's freaking daunting, eh? Hey, do that. Yeah. That was, to start again is very daunting. Yeah. There was mornings I'd, I wasn't getting out of bed until 10 o'clock and, you know, I'd roll over and just go, what the fuck am I going to do today? Like, just go cruise around, see a few boys and, you know, just trying to find something, I guess. Like, trying to fill a hole that kind of got deeper in water that, before I could even realise. So you're still doing the roofing job now? Or? Yeah, still doing roofing. And that's how good, eh? Yeah, I, I love it. Um, I can't complain, really. You know, the boys are pretty good, pretty tight group. Have you still you stayed in contact with boys from the Army? Yeah, so I've got two really, really good mates that I met because we were both, uh, all three of us were getting medically discharged at the time. Oh, shit. So uh, separate injuries and stuff like that. You know, some days we were just feeling shit and, you know, we'd go to uh, Annie's up in Townsville. Oh. Annie's Coffee or whatever it is, I can't remember. We'd just have breakfast and, you know just talk and see how each other are going because like I, like I was saying before it's a big awakening I guess you know not being forced out of your dream job but you know you no longer can do it no more um, so you know, we were there for each other making sure that we were trying to be as best and positive as we can and making sure that we were all good and you, you struggle with that so you end up going in a bit of a dark hole eh? yeah I definitely fell down um had a good stumble. Um, you know, life gets carried away when you start working and start trying to find your feet again. Um, started talking to the boys a bit less and less. You know, they got their lives, I got mine. And it got to the point where, you know, I just stopped working altogether. I just didn't really want a bar of it anymore. Was this before the roofing job? Yeah, before yeah, the roofing job. Yeah, limbo the time. When I just had my limbo mode where I just... 
the days were feeling like they were weighing a ton. You just didn't want to do anything. Like, I could lay in bed all day and just not be fussed, doing nothing. Um, so, yeah, and, you know, Dad started to pick up on it and he would do his checkups and as best as, you know, a father can do, um, checking up on me, making sure that I was all right and, you know, I was giving him the short and sweet story. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Just having one of them days. I'll be good tomorrow. And tomorrow would be a repeat of today. And it would just go in that vicious circle. Um, And then stopped going to the gym, started drinking, which was probably a really bad mistake when I was at that time frame, um, when I was getting down. You know, started two beers after work to 10, 15. Yeah. Um, and got to that point and I ended up... I knew that deep down it was going to happen, um, that I was going to try and commit. I just didn't know when or how. And in my phone I had written a will for Dad, um, message for my friends and loved ones and stuff like that. So I I knew yeah, that... You planned it. Yeah, I, I planned it without planning it, if that makes sense. I knew that it was going to happen. I just didn't know when or how. Um, when you wrote these messages and whatnot, mate, did you... I, I find when there's something on my mind, you know, and like I, I can write it out. I'll write it, even if you want to you want to tell a person something or whatnot. Write them a big message, but don't actually send it. Yeah. And I found, in, over my time, that's really helped me. When you wrote these messages, you know, of you are going to leave to people, did you, did they help you at all to maybe not do it? It did. I, I, and I think that's what held me for that extra couple of days and weeks. Because um, I had written it really, um, real heartfelt, you know, big message to Dad and all my siblings. Um, they all got their own kind of little message. Um, and I think the hardest one was... Well, they're all hard, but to write to your siblings to say that you can't be that big brother no more and, you you know, you'll always be there to watch them, but you just couldn't be there physically. Um, So it it was hard to accept that in a sense. Um, I knew that I wanted to see them succeed, but I knew I wouldn't be able to do it in person because I just had that mindset that... I knew that it was going to happen and I just wanted to let them know that it wasn't their fault and I really did love them and um, definitely try and make sure there was no blame or anything on their end Um, and to just, yeah, have that final little say, I guess. This man must be fucking heavy to write, this sort of stuff. Oh, it was, you know, I was, was probably two, three in the morning and I was writing this stuff and I had tears in my eyes and crying and sobbing and stuff like that but you know when you're in that place you kind of just know you just yeah you don't know when or how but you want to make sure that they know that they're loved um and I wrote a big one to dad and just basically said that I wish I could have been the half the man that he is you know he's had a lot of knockbacks and he's it, it's always just seemed that he's bounced back so much better and just always said to him I was like you know you fucking do us all proud the way you handle different situations and stuff like that and thanked him for giving me the knowledge of the cars and stuff because that that held me on for a long time um, spending time in the shed with dad and then yeah, it, it was definitely hard to write them kind of heart, heartfelt messages because you'd rather say it in person, but definitely can't say it in person when you're in that kind of headspace. Yeah, and the lead up to like all this, did you did you seek help or you just did you talk to anyone about that? Hey, you you think about you know you want to commit suicide? Have you, did you chat to anyone about that? I knew that I was getting depressed and, you know, I, I'd start talking to Dad, but I wasn't letting on with all the dark 
side of things. Like I wasn't telling him that I, I was feeling that I wanted to take my life. I was just saying to him, like, you know, I'm finding it hard today. I, I might just go to bed and go lay down. I wasn't... He didn't, wasn't know the, he didn't know the degree of what you're suffering. Yeah, no, he just knew that I was definitely suffering and, I, you know, I was definitely feeling pretty hard, I guess. Um, and that man, he, he could read me and he just... He didn't want to push me to that point that I broke down, but he wanted to know that he was there for me without going over that boundary, so... Can we dive into that day of when you decide you had enough and you wanted to end it? Like, what'd you do? You just woke up like any other day and got into it, or what, how did that all roll out? Yeah, it was probably like probably like another day, you know, 9.30, 10 o'clock, I woke up and on a sad day and just... You know, when you... It's hard to explain, sorry. Um, you just know today is just going to be a lot harder than most days and just felt real daunting I guess um that's the way it felt to me anyway and I'd reached out to another mate and he said you know you really should come around for a beer and a check up because he knew that I was down in the dumps and stuff like that and um I said yeah 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 you know I've been meaning to catch up with you for a long time and so anyway we stopped at the bottle and whatnot and got a lot of grog for because I knew that if it was going to happen today I definitely wanted to be definitely yeah drunk and try and not feel it as much as possible um so went about got all the grog and you know got back to his place and it's a it's a weird fact that I picked up on but um as we were walking through his backyard to his little outdoor area thing he had like a little bar and I had seen a um, it looked like a steak knife you know one of the ones that you get from pubs and stuff like the real pointy end not the ones that are rounded off yeah Yeah, real big steak knife and I was eyeing it off and I, I, I don't know why I was just looking at it and I said, well, that's probably one way to do it or whatnot. But I definitely wanted to, you know, have a drink with him and catch up and talk a bit of shit. Um, And the more that we started to drink and stuff like that, um, I, I could feel it a lot more than I had in the morning. So I ended up putting a story up on Snapchat and... You know, a bit of a weird one, but I just said, you know, it's going to be one of them days. I can't exactly what I, like, put up, but said something. And it must have clicked to uh, Dad and Nan, because Nan um, was on the couch with Dad and they were watching TV and Nan's kind of gone, oh, something's not right here. And Dad's like, oh, no, no, it might be all right. And um, Nan's like, no, like... I've got that gut feeling. And it must have been the perfect time, I guess, because Dad had found out where my mate was. I didn't tell anyone where I was going. Um, You know, they super sleuthed the shit out of this, followed my um, Snapchat location, found out where I was. And as he's walked in, he's, you know, he's a bit pissed because he was going through a bit of his own thing, um, which I was kind of feeling as well. I felt bad for him because he was not dealing just with my shit. He was dealing with his own shit, you know. But, you know, we had a bit of a backwards and forth. And he said, you know what, get in the car, we're going home. And at that time, I I just didn't want to argue with him no more. And as we were kind of walking back down the side of the house, I made sure that he was in front of me. And as I was walking just behind him, you've got to go past the bar to the side of the house on the gate and as he was walking away he wasn't looking at me and it was just kind of that perfect time just slid my hand over the bar and had grabbed the steak knife and just as he had reached the gate I said I'm sorry dad and I love you and 
as he's turned around, he's kind of watched me just plunge this knife in my throat. And I knew, I knew where I was putting it and how deep, because I had nicked my femoral artery. So there was a lot of blood. And Dad was a security guard. He's seen all this kind of stuff. And something just clicked in him, and he's kind of grabbed me to pull the knife out. And we had a bit of backwards and forwards, and we were, you know, pushing each other, each other and stuff like that. And he's trying to grab the knife, and I ended up pushing it that deep that the handle had snapped off the blade. So I threw the handle at him. He's trying to grab my neck to... Um, trying to grab the blade and obviously it was that deep that you couldn't see the blade no more um, so by that time we were on the ground rolling around because I, I, I knew that I, this is what I wanted um, and I was going to make it happen at that time so we're fighting you know rolling around backwards and forwards and he kept just saying, give me the knife, give me the knife. And I was like, no, nah, fuck off. Like, this is what I want. I, I'm done, Dad. I'm tired. And I kept just repeating that to him. And I was like, I'm tired, Dad. I love you. But this is this is it. Like, I, I'm tired. I just, enough's enough. Um, and he kept trying to grab my neck and trying to stop the bleeding. And he ended up almost getting the blade. So I stuck my... Uh, point a finger and my thumb in my neck and had grabbed the blade out and I had thrown it at him and I rolled over and I was putting my fingers in in my neck trying to make the wound a little bit bigger so I could bleed out faster and whatnot and by that time my mate and his mum had called for the police and ambulance and whatnot and all that and they showed up pretty quick um, dad had managed to rip my shirt off put it on my neck to try and slow down this bleeding because, um, yeah, I, I was losing a lot of blood. Um, they had got there. The police were the first, and I, I only remember, like, certain bits and pieces. I had this copper. He was trying to sit on my chest to... because I was rolling around. I, I, I was making a mission of this, I guess. Um, and he was trying to restrain me to get me ready to go into the ambulance and whatnot. And he ended up sitting on my chest and I had grabbed him and I was trying to push him off of me and, you know, we had a big tussle and they ended up getting me with, I think it was 10 milligrams of morphine. I was still moving around and they ended up hitting me with uh, five mils of ketamine before they got me into the ambulance a chopper came and landed um you know i I'd, I'd done a really good job um so yeah um it was definitely crazy because i knew that it, it, it was my time and i just kept saying to dad my phone's unlocked just read it and you know um definitely another little bit of a weird thing um I had actually died twice. Dad had to give me CPR twice. So I remember the first time that I had gone out, I just, you know, touched him on the face and I was saying, I was love you, like I loved you. And I just felt like I was, you know, feeling a little bit dizzy. I was just telling him that I loved him and tell the kids that I love them too and, you know. And then I woke up because my, like... It was weird I kind of come back too because my chest was sore and it was because Dad had given me CPR. And then we, you know, started arguing again and then I ended up waking up in the ambulance and, you know, that's when they were giving me the shot of ketamine into my foot because I was still apparently trying to move around and still trying to fight. Um... Ended up getting to the hospital, don't remember it, I ended up passing out due to blood loss and all the drugs that they had pumped me full. And I probably woke up two days later, I'd like to say, I might be wrong, 
um, to dad in the room and two of my other siblings. I had 25 stitches on the inside of my neck and another 10 across my neck and two, one or two stitches put in my jugular because I had torn the muscle and just nicked the artery. So they said that I was very lucky because if I was, you know, 0.5 of a mil to the left, I would have fully severed it and that would have, I, I would have died. There was no saving. So, you know, I was, I was in the hospital for almost a week, I would say, um, and I definitely got lucky and they'd come in and told me, you know, what, what they had to do. They had to stitch some of my inside of my neck back together because I'd, you know, steak knife. Minced yourself? Yeah, minced minced it all. Um, so they had to stitch some of it back together and obviously, you know, try and make it all right. And they did. Um, ended up getting discharged, spoke to the hospital staff and they said that they wanted to start on antidepressants and stuff like that, seek counselling and, you know, whatnot. And I think the first four days after getting out of hospital, I don't think I ever slept so much. It was, I would wake up, might even go to the bathroom, and then I was back to bed, like, just... And where was the mindset at that? A little bit different, like, I had realised that I had let down a lot of people. Were you happy to be alive? Definitely happy to be alive, and, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it was definitely a massive fucking wake up call to get to that point and then realise wait this is actually what I want you know I'll, I want to be that brother I want to be that friend I want to be that son um, so it, it, it was a very big kind of wake up call so how's the relationship with you and your dad after this I'll definitely say it's a lot lot better I'd be lying if I said that it was worse um you know, like, he does his little check-ins and, you know, if I'm not awake by a certain time on a sad day, he'll come in and just jump on me, you know, and he's not a little man, he's he's heavy. This could this be something very fucking wild for him to uh, recover from. Yeah. Seeing his, his son, like, his flesh and blood, like, in that state. Yeah. Fucking heavy for him, isn't it? It, it was definitely heavy. Um, it took us a while to actually talk about it after... I'd come home and I think it was about three months after and I said to him, I was like, you know what, bloke, I'm actually so sorry but so grateful that you were there and we ended up talking about it and he said, you know, I've never been so scared in my life to lose a son, let alone any family member. Yeah, and, you know, there's still days where, you know, I'll shit him to tears and he's like, but I'm glad I still have you. So. It's crazy the two frames of mind at that scene that day. You're, you're, you're in that frame of mind where you just want to die. Even after you've done it, you just said you're trying to make the wound bigger and yeah. you just want to die. Yeah. And then you got the father in the other frame of mind of, I need to save you. Yeah, and, yeah. and I feel so bad for him. You know, no one ever wants to see that happen yeah. and... It was definitely hard for him, I know that. You know, it would be hard for anyone. Oh, shit, yeah. Fucking ass. Nice. So what do you, what have you done? So um, you weren't on antidepressants or anything on the lead up to this? No. Yeah, shit, eh? Oh, now, um, had a few trial and errors with different medication yeah, and stuff like that. Just... Yeah. You know, tried phylloxetine or something like that. Yeah. Always forget the name. Yeah, um, yeah, it was making me stay awake. I just felt drowsy all the time. Um, so I changed a few. Found one that works really well for me now. Just got to remember to take it. That's yeah. probably my biggest weakness. I'm oh, terrible for that too. <laughs> oh, some mornings, you know, you feel like you're running late. So, you, you know, grab the keys, grab your lunchbox and you're yeah. out. Yeah. And then, you you know, so I've got a, I've now worked out. If I've got a spare box in my car, yeah. you know, on my way to work, I'm like, fuck, I haven't taken my tablets now. Yeah. And, you know, I'll have them. Um, but yeah, I've definitely noted, like, picked up a notice in my mood, my behaviour, and how I interact with people. I guess too, like you know, 
since the meeting you like you gave me that phone call and you mate you, you sound like a firecracker right? like you, you present yourself you hold yourself very well you know while you were at the boat today with those you know bloody um, hustling for me getting the people to come in and buy entries you hold yourself very well man you're, uh, you're very respectable young fellow it's bloody nice to see and I was um I was talking to your partner earlier I said it, it blows my mind like when I met, met you yeah. of how you held yourself and just how down to earth genuine man you are and it breaks my heart to know that you were in that state of mind. Yeah. You know, it's fucking terrible, man. And I'm, I'm glad you're here to tell your story and you can get, get past it. Yeah, I'm definitely glad to be here. And, um, you know, even if this helps one or two people to reach out and, you know, like I'm, you know, if someone came up to me anywhere in the street and said, you know, I'm feeling a bit rough, how do I go about this? You know, we're grabbing a cup of coffee yeah. or, or a Coke or something, and we're going to talk about this. One thing I want to talk to you about um, in this mindset, like I've been I've been uh, four months now, no alcohol, right? Yep. Um, do you think if you were sober at that time, you would have done that? Probably probably not, eh? Um, and, I, I, like, it took me a long time to realise that because, you know... It, and it's not to, you know, toot my own horn or nothing like that, but a fucking knife to the throat, like, that's a lot of courage. And and to, you know, a sober person, that, that's just pure stupidity. And I think that... There's definitely alcohol to watch today. Yeah, you know, that mindset, mindset and then the alcohol on top of that, like that liquid courage, as some would say, you know, kind of just went hand in hand and, yeah just all happened so hey you you, you you still have a beer now you have a drink now um for a long time it, it would have been geez it's almost it's been a full year now since i tried to commit and i think it's only the last two months that i've had one or two drinks so you know and i'm i'm talking like one or two and it's blue moon kind of thing yeah. um and I think it's just because I'm still really nervous of, you know, the last time I got that headed and it went to that zone, like... Yeah, exactly sort of the same reason I'd given it up. I was just drinking for the wrong reasons and getting myself in some states of mind that were just fucking yeah. scary to be in, eh? Oh, definitely. Really scary to be in. I, and I didn't want to go and do something stupid and it be alcohol-related, you know? Yeah. So I'd, I'd give up the drinking and, like... I still get the thoughts, you know, I still definitely have my dark days. Like only last night, mate, I laid, I was so hard on myself yesterday for not hitting sales like I wanted to. Yeah. And I laid in this van last night, man, and I was fuckers with the checkout. Hey, I was just got, laying there for a couple of hours and just got myself in a real state. And, um, but you know, like I just had, I talked to myself and I said, snap out of it, tomorrow's a new day, you got down it tomorrow, you know? Yeah. And all I could think last night, the time was like, I'm glad I'm not drunk. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not drunk because I fucking just keep going spiralling and spiralling down bursts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, that's that's the biggest thing, you know, once you start drinking, you start second-guessing a lot of different things. Um, and like you were just saying, you know, being in that rough spot too, you know, you didn't meet, meet sales, you know, you kind of not letting anyone else down, you feel like you're letting yourself down all at the same time. Yeah. So then, you you know, you start really beating yourself up for no reason. We can be very cruel to ourselves as humans. Yeah. Extremely cruel to ourselves. It's actually insane that how hard we can really be to ourselves. Yeah, we definitely got to find outlets to, you know, to deal with that sort of shit. So, so what do you, so you, you've done, uh, so you're on the antidepressants, you, you're not, are you talking to anyone or are you, you haven't gone back to counselling? Haven't really, it didn't feel like counselling was for me. Um, so I've just really been talking to Dad. Opening up more. Yeah, opening up more, really bouncing off different family members and uh, telling my best mates that we got medically discharged with. You know, I'll shoot them a message when I'm feeling shitty and just ask them how they're going and you're just having a little bit of backwards and forwards. And, like, we don't talk every day. It can be, you know, once every two months. Yeah. You know, that little checkup. Yeah. So... Definitely. Hashtag check on the boys. Yeah, definitely check on the boys. Make sure that they're going good and strong. Um, and it's really not weak or selfish to reach out and 
ask for help, even if it's just, you know, just for a bit of a yarn. Yeah. You know, it, it's not that hard. It is, um, and I've had this with friends and that who were stewing on something and they, you can see they're struggling, you can see they're stewing on something, but just, just tell me what's wrong. Yeah. Just talk to me. And then they have a talk. And like, it could be mine, it could be fucking huge. Yeah. So you feel better now? Well, yeah, I fucking do. Yeah. And, you know, it is the simplest fucking thing. Um, you know, it could be like, you know, I'm just kind of beating myself up. But once you talk to the boys or talk to anyone and just go, look, this is what's going on, you f- work it out with between each other and, you know, you come up with a different idea to how to go, all right, I've messed up here. Yeah. How can we, you know, tomorrow can be better by doing this. And, like, I felt, you know, I was having a shit day and I'm like, oh, tomorrow's just going to be shit because today's shit. But you really got to find that mindset, you know. Today was shit, but how can I better it tomorrow? Exactly, man. Exactly. And what I've learned from my life coach, right, is when I'm having a bad day, it you can have a bad day. We're going to have bad days. You're going to have more days. You know, it's definitely going to happen. You're going to have another bad day. But when you have these bad days come along, I used to just lay in bed, dwell, fucking sulk, just, you know. Beat yourself up. Just, yeah, just drown myself with my own fucking misery. Now I'll have a bad day, but I'll. I'll keep going. Yeah. I'll do, like, if I plan, okay, so I'm going to film this video or I'm going to do this podcast, I'll still go up and do it. Yeah. Even though I'm feeling like shit, just, you just got to keep going. Yeah. Just keep going. And then, then before you know it, it's the next day. Yeah. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'm back in action again. Yeah. You know, setting them, like, smaller goals and, you know, yeah, really trying to strive to, you know, make it to the day and try and find all kinds of different positives. Yeah. You know, there is a lot of positives out there that will definitely outweigh the negatives. 100%. And, you know, yeah, you can have a shit day, but you've got to just try and dig deep, find them positives, and yeah. just push through it. Because tomorrow, it's definitely going to be better, and it's definitely going to be well worth it. 100%. Black and eight, man. So what's, what's in the store for the future for you now? What's the go? Well, now that I've, you know, I, I've been taking it real slow, just plotting along and had some really good offers uh cooling on different cars uh really working on you know just learning about drag racing you know it's a sport that you never stop learning with um so i eventually you know want to buy dad's car off of him when he's had his fun we've got something in the works um so yeah that'll be good but at the moment he's just kind of plotting along getting it ready um so he wants to race a little bit more and then once he's ready to hang up the boots, it's kind of, yeah, hand it over to me. And um, hopefully I can just be as half as good as him, I guess. Yeah. Um, that man's got so much knowledge. and Can he drive? Fucking oath he can. Yeah. I, I've seen that guy do some wicked stuff um, behind the wheel. You know, he had one axle snap on him in a modified altered. They were a very short car. And he managed to pull off a 180 when it snapped. He was facing back to the starting line. And he had managed to miss the wall, pull it up into a nice stop and get out of the car, look at it and go, ah, fucked up. (laughs) Ah, well, you know, like not many people can do that kind of stuff. And, you know, it takes a lot of talent and a lot of knowledge. Fucking quick reaction. Oh, definitely quick reaction. You know, like when it's going south, it's going south pretty hard. And, you know, he caught it at that perfect time and he walked away. It is blowing my mind, the sport, man. Look, I was said to you earlier um, never been around the drag racing scene really yeah. I went once when I was probably 15 and it's just never been my thing I don't know if it's never been my thing or just not exposed to it but fuck me man the atmosphere is unreal oh it, it is um, I reckon we've probably got some of the best and most lovely people around this sport um, most kind had it like uh, one of the little junior cars that I'm working on you know she ran too fast we needed weight to slow down the car yeah right um, and we've got guys pitted beside us, and, I was, and they've got little junior dragsters too. And I said, look, what's the chance I can borrow a bit of weight, slow the car down? And he's like, yeah, mate, how much weight do you need? You know, like just small things like that. Why are we trying to slow the fucking car down? Are they able to go to go fast? Definitely, but, um, you know, some cars, you've got to set a dial in. Um, and you need... Fair, it? Yeah, to make it fair. Um, and with the juniors, you know, they're still kids as, as much as you look at it. And... 110 k's an hour for a 16, 17 year old kid. That's pretty quick. 
So, um, and how old's your, your sister that's raising? 12, 13. Don't quote me on this. It is her birthday. That's as much as I know. Her birthday? Yeah, it's her birthday coming up in three weeks. Mate, that's awesome, eh? Young, um, young chick and a little buddy Junior drags to send it. Yeah, and she you know, she makes it hard for Dad and I, um, you know, cutting a 002, 001, yeah, yeah. you know, backing it up and making it hard for us big boys. So <laughs> it, it's definitely wild, but um, every time she gets in that car, she just makes me proud, yeah. you know. Um, some things, you, you know, you can't teach kids, but, you know, this kid's pre-staged a little too deep, and she's waited for that little bit longer to take off and still got a green. So it's just crazy. Your whole family's lovely, man. Like, he's all just such fucking kind, genuine people, eh? It's a bit of delight spending these few days with yours. Oh, it's good to have you around too, though. Like, you know, we, you know, like, not a lot of people are like that, but we try and see the best and, you know, we're, I wouldn't say we're well known around here, but we try and give everyone the best and hope that, you know, there's different drivers that we're really good friends with and, you know, before they go out, I always like we all try and get out there and you know tell them good luck, be safe, because you know you're pushing some of these cars to the extreme and you know it it is hard to on these cars and people can get hurt. So, um, so you know you once once you become pretty friendly with some people, you try and give them the best to make sure that they're safe and they know you've got them in the back of their mind. Yeah. You know, yeah. even with the juniors. Uh, I'll be standing beside my little sister and, you know, you're having all these other parents and kids coming up, be safe out there, you know, you've got this. And very close-knitted sport, I reckon. Yeah, no, it's been it's been awesome, man. I fucking loved it. So, mind you, it's too fucking cold. Yeah, it's definitely cold. I think they know why they call it Winter Nationals. Yeah. Fucking hell, man. Oh, this one's cock out of you as fuck. <laughs> it is definitely freezing out of you. I reckon this morning uh, we got the minus four at one stage. Yeah, um, I did see that. No, but, like it's stupid. Yeah, <laughs> but all I can say is last year, if you were here, you would have been spewing. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it got to minus eight degrees one morning. Like, we come out of my swag and when I've peeled the flap up to get out, all you could hear was like a little ice crashing, up, good. crashing out, and I was like, "No way, it's freezing." Well, I got my uh, I got my swag here, yeah. and I've been sleeping in this caravan, but I'm gonna sleep in that swag, not man. I think the canvas is gonna keep me cold, uh, warmer. Yeah, so I'm fucking freezing. <laughs> like, I suppose like the more and more you kind of come out to these different big events, like Winter Nationals, you get a little bit more adjusted. But last year was a lot colder than it is this year, I reckon. I'll put it this way. I I can't function. I can't fucking start a day without having a shower. I have to have a fucking shower. Yes. Now, I didn't have a fucking shower this morning. It was that cold. I skipped my morning shower. I reckon that would be the first time in fuck me. 15 years, I reckon. I haven't had a shower in the morning, man. And I reckon I'm going the same way tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, I reckon so too. Because, yeah, you're exactly right. I didn't shower um, this morning. I just... You know, rolled out of the swag, and I was like, nah, it's too cold. Put, you know, put my uh, trackies on and jumper on, and then slowly potted out and had a coffee. Let's get into it. Yeah. Oh, fuck. Ty, thank you so much for coming on and talking to me, man. It's been great. Um, fucking heavy story, bro. I'm, I'm glad you're here to tell it. Uh, don't do that again, please. No, definitely not, uh, definitely not. I don't know how to fight, but I'll fucking learn. <laughs> but, no, nah, um, you know, thanks for letting me come on and share my story. Yeah, hopefully it... It helps a lot of young fellas out there, older bikes, you know, like, you know, you, you can hit rock bottom and there's still a, there's still more ahead. Yeah, you can, absolutely. You can, you can come back, you come back from the dead. Yeah, twice in my case, but, um, yeah. Fuck yeah, dad. Yeah, <laughs> number one dad. Uh-huh. But, um, I, I just did want to say one thing, boys, ladies, gents, um, you know, if you're down and you're really feeling like you're rock bottom, just... Try and see them positives, and if you ever see me in person, you'll definitely know my ugly mug from a mile away. So uh, come up, have a chat, and really get amongst it, because all it takes is a five to ten minute chat to brighten a day. So I'm always keen for a chat. And that is that is spot on, mate. And just to add to that, you can change someone's mindset so fucking easy. Yeah. You know, a stranger's mindset. Yeah. Something as simple as saying get a as you walk past on the footpath, 
can be enough to snap them out of the mindset. Just, you don't know what they're thinking about just then, you know? And that's as little as it could take, man. It doesn't cost you fuck all to be kind. No. And you don't realise what you can do for someone. And that's the beautiful fucking thing yeah. is the smallest little comment or just like you were saying, saying good day to someone. And just for them to snap out of whatever mindset, whatever they were thinking, to go, hey, he actually acknowledged me. Maybe I do matter. That's just enough to change their mindset yeah. for the day and it could save their life, man. Something very simple, eh? People don't realise that. No. So um, that's why I wanted to say my little piece. And, um, yeah, if you ever do see my fucked up head, definitely come up and say hello. Appreciate your time, man. That's uh, awesome. No, thanks for letting me come on. Thank you.